uh, live now. So, good afternoon and welcome to this event. As you know, Colloquia Patavina is a colloquium series in mathematics and computer science organized by our Department of Mathematics. And the TIT is the first uh, colloquium uh, given uh, in uh, telematics form. But uh, we hope that uh, this uh, emergency situation will be an opportunity to have uh, a wider, more unusual uh, audience with respect to our standard. Other telematic uh, colloquia will be organized uh, in the next month. And uh, for me, Today's opportunity is the realization of an old dream, the dream of being able to host Professor Sherry Breger in Padova. Of course, this is only a partial realization of my dream, because Sherry lives in Australia, not in Padova. But I hope that there will be further occasions to have Sherry in Padova. Kelly Preger is an emeritus professor of mathematics at the University of Western Australia. She was the first woman to be president of the Australian Mathematical Society. She has served on the executive of the International Mathematical Union and on the council and executive of the Australian Academy of Science. She is a former vice president of the International Commission for Mathematical Instruction and a former foreign secretary of the Australian Academy of Science. Last year, she was awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science on the recognition of her incredible contribution to mathematics research and education in Australia and around the world. Her mathematical research work in algebra and combinatorics has transformed our understanding of how groups act on large complex systems. Her published research includes more than 400 journal articles and five research monographs. Today, she will give a talk on a fascinating topic. And the title is Mathematics of Shuffling. Before starting with the talk, let me say that Cheryl told us that she will be pleased to be interrupted with your question even during the talk. So if you have some question, you can write your question on the YouTube chat and we will try in some way to manage your question. So please, Sherry, start with your talk. Thank you, Professor Lucchini. And I am absolutely delighted to be giving this virtual colloquium talk in Padova. And I also hope that there will be an opportunity when um, I can visit Padova face to face and meet all the students and meet you and um, enjoy the absolutely wonderful um, city of Padova. Um, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk today. I am um, going to talk about the mathematics of shuffling. And before I share my screen with the slides, I wanted to explain that I really do mean shuffling cards. So I have a pack of cards and the first part of the talk will be talking about perfect shuffles. So I'll, I'll tell you first, I do not know how to do a proper perfect shuffle, but I'll explain it mathematically. So we have our cards and to do a perfect shuffle, we would take half the cards and place them one in each hand and then we into interleave them perfectly. I can't do that. But what I mean is we have half of the cards on each side and we pick up one card from here and one card from the other side and the second one and the second one 
and so on and so on. And we have interchanged and we've changed the ordering of the cards. So that's what the talk is going to be about. Let me show you why it has some mathematics and eventually I will um, tell you a little bit, bit about some of the, oops, let me see if I can do this properly. Yes, <laughs> I hope that's worked. Um, a, bit, a bit about the mathematics that I have done in the last year or two with two young colleagues, Carmen Amara, who's from the Philippines, and Luke Morgan. Luke is Welsh and uh, he's currently working in Slovenia. Um, but a couple of years ago, they were both together for a whole year in, um, in Perth working with me. Okay, mathematics of shuffling. Um, I was inspired by this by some very uh, early work um, some decades ago by Percy Diaconis, Ron Graham and Bill Cantor. And I want to talk about their work first before the new work of Carmen and Luke and myself. So as I said, we're, we'll be talking about perfect shuffles and um, it, just to show you with a small pack of cards, if we had say 12 cards, and I'll call them cards zero, one, two, up to 11, I would split those that pack of cards into two. And I explained how we would do a perfect shuffle, but I didn't tell you that there's really a choice. And there are two shuffles that I could have done. So if I take the cards zero up to six, and place them on one side, and I have cards seven to 11, oh, sorry, zero up to five, and then six to 11 on the other side, which one do I pick up first? So if I pick up the, the zero card, the one that used to be on top, it's still going to be on top. If I pick that up first, and then card six, then card one, then card seven, I'll end up with the same card on top as it used to be. And that's called an out shuffle. The other choice was that I picked up the top card from the second pile first, and then card zero, then seven, then one, and so on. And I will get a different ordering of those cards. And the shuffle group is what we would get if we were allowing ourselves to do out shuffles and in shuffles in any order, any number of times. So what are the questions we would ask about this sort of shuffling? Perhaps if I was a card player, I would ask, can I get the top card into any position I like? by repeating these shuffles. Or perhaps I might ask, can I get to a particular ordering of the pack of cards? Or how many shuffles to get back to where I started? Or can I randomize the order in some ways by shuffling enough times? Or maybe if I'm just a mathematician like me, um, how many different orderings are there and what sort of mathematics is going on? Okay, so in order to talk about it mathematically, we usually um, encode the shuffle in what we call a permutation. So here is the first out shuffle that I showed you with, 11, with 12 cards, zero up to 11. After the out shuffle, those cards were reordered. So they were zero, six, one, seven, etc. So what has happened to the cards? Well, zero has stayed put. So I'm going to write zero with parentheses, brackets around it. Um, card one has gone into the position of two. Two has gone to position four. Four has gone into position eight. So I'm going to write down here, one goes to two, two went to four, four went to eight. And I keep going and find out that um, if I get as far as six, what's happened to six? Six has gone to, 
six has gone, to, where's six gone? Six gone back here. Six has gone back to position one. So I've cycled all these around in a cycle, I guess, of length 10. And 11, of course, has stayed put because it was the bottom card. So that's what the shuffle would look like in a different way of writing it down. And I hope you understand what I mean by, by this, um, interpreting this as a permutation of the cards. If we do the same thing with the in shuffle, so remember with the in shuffle, I picked up the, the card that was halfway down and that became the top card. And so I've got this new reordering. And so what's happened here is that zero has gone to position one, one has gone to position three, and I can keep on writing it down. And I find out that I don't come back to position zero until I get right to the end. So I have a very different structure of what the in shuffle is doing to the cards than the out shuffle. Now, this is just one example when I have 12 cards. We'd like to be able to do this in general, but we can at least see that they are different sorts of operations on the cards. And what we um, talk about as the shuffle group is the set of all the different permutations of the cards that we can obtain by performing any sequence of ins and out shuffles of any, any number of times in any order. And, and that will give us um, a set of shuffles and it will actually be a group in the sense that we can keep on repeating these shuffles and we get a, a, a group, a subgroup of the symmetric group of all possible permutations of the two end cards. So that's our shuffle group. We might ask, how big is it? Um, does, it just, does it just grow bigger and bigger when the number of cards gets bigger? Um, what can we say about it? So that's part of what we're going to ask. And these are the people who actually answered those questions. And it's quite a long time ago. It's 1983. They published a fabulous paper. I really recommend you to look at it. It's a lovely paper, Diaconus, Graham and Cantor. Here they are. The paper is called The Mathematics of Perfect Shuffles. And in that paper, they explain that they are not the first people to look at the mathematics of shuffling. And they give um, an interesting discussion about earlier work. Uh, one thing they mention is um, a paper by Alex Ellensley, 1957, long time ago. And um, they point out the importance of this strange quantity here. The order of two modulo one less than the number of cards. So what that means is, so if I had, um, so the order of two is the number of times I have to multiply two together so that um, I will get a number which will give me remainder one when I divide through by two n minus one. It's this funny quantity, but he figured out that this was important for shuffling. And maybe we'll see this come up later, but one uh, way we will see it is um, a paper of Gollum, 1961, where um, he's talking about something where you can't really do perfect shuffles. You start off with a deck and it's got an odd number of cards instead of an even number. So you can't really split them completely evenly. If you split it into one lot of n and one lot of n minus one, and you try to do the same thing, you get your shuffles, the group is, much, is quite small. And perhaps you think this is not quite small, but it's about the number of cards times this order. And we'll see that if you've got an even number of cards, you'll get much, much larger groups. So that's, the, that's all I'm going to say about having an odd number of cards. They also um, talk about applications of this perfect shuffling to modeling parallel processing algorithms for computers. So it's quite a fun paper. But uh, for me, a person interested in groups, um, a big interest in this uh, paper is that they work out the shuffle groups. 
And I'm going to show you on the next slide what they prove. And I am not really going to talk us through what's here, but they, they show that the, the structure of the shuffle group um, looks a bit differently. So the shuffle group is on the right-hand column and it's got all sorts of different entries there. And if you look on the left-hand column, you'll see that it seems to depend on N modulo four, whether you get remainder zero, one, two, or three mod four. Right up the top, there's a special infinite family of cases where the number of cards is a power of two. Down the bottom, there's a couple of other ones which don't seem to fit the pattern of, of um, the general pattern. So that's probably typical of mathematics. There's a general thing that's happening and maybe there's a few special exceptions. So I want to explain this a little bit. Some of you who might be group theorists might see a rather interesting symbol down the bottom called M12. That's what attracted the attention of a lot of group theorists when they saw this M12 coming up. So now I want to tell you about how a group theorist would describe the groups. This was a picture that um, was made by the government department uh, just before the Prime Minister's Prize for Science was announced last October. And they wanted to get a, um, a diagram, an, an image that would describe what I do as a group theorist. And this image of a tree is really describing the structure of a group, how I think of a group. And I said that typically for a finite group, we could split the group into two parts, like the root of the tree um, gives two branches. And each of those two parts is a smaller group. Um, and then we can keep on trying to split and the split the groups into smaller parts. A group theorist would say we were taking a normal subgroup and a quotient, but generally we're just splitting it into two parts until we get to a spot where we can't split it anymore. And this, this, this process stops and that stops at the leaves. And so these leaves are what um, the group theorists would call the, the simple groups or the fact, the composition factors of the group. And there are many, many trees that you can construct for the same group in general, but it turns out that the actual simple groups that you find at the leaves of this tree are always the same. You always get the same number of simple groups occurring the same number of times, no matter what tree you use. And you can do things like find the size of the group by multiplying together the sizes of the simple factors that are associated with it. And so what are these finite simple groups? What do they really look like? Well, I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> the finite simple groups could usually come in infinite families, just a finite number of infinite families, and they are like the columns. Um, some of the infinite families look a bit longer than some of the others. So this one on the left here is a bit like the family of groups that you would get from matrix groups, the, the, the linear groups. And um, the ones which are a bit shorter are the ones, and, oh, sorry, I should say these linear groups, they can get bigger in two different ways. They can get bigger because the size of the matrices are getting bigger, or they can get bigger because the field size that the entries come from are getting bigger. So they're sort of doubly infinite. Whereas the ones in the middle here are the ex called the exceptional Lie type groups and they can only get bigger by the field size. Um, as well as these, there's a special separate column which are the cyclic groups. They're also simple groups. And then right down the bottom, there are 26 groups. So this is only 26. There's not infinite that I can't draw. It's only 26. And they're called the sporadic simple groups. And the last thing on the left that don't really fit there, but we've put them there, 
is um, the group of alternating groups, which are the majority of the, um, the groups that we're calling these symmetric permutation groups. So these represent all of the simple groups. It's a pretty um, picture of them. Uh, it's a bit like the periodic table of elements. And it was um, constructed by a young um, American mathematician to explain to his father what the simple groups looked like. And he gave it to his father on Father's Day. So if I go back to the shuffle groups, one of the things that um, they that we see from that table beforehand is that um, there's something quite extraordinary that happens with these shuffles. Um, and it's something that Diaconus, Cantor and um, Graham found, and they called it central symmetry. And so um, what, we've, what they discovered is that there's a pairing of the cards and I have paired up the cards three and eight. And how, why have I chosen them? Well, I've counted in one, two, three spots from the left and I found a three and I cut, count three spots from the right and I find an eight. After the out shuffle, this is the, the ordering. And I find that the three and the eight are again positioned equally from the left and the right. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six in from the left for the three and six in from the right for the eight. And after the in shuffle, we find the same thing. They're again, symmetrically um, situated, the three and the eight. And this happens for every single pair. If I wanted um, the one, it's gonna get paired with the 10. And if I have a look up here after the out shuffle, here's the one and the 10 equally spaced from the two ends. Here's the one and the 10 equally spaced from the two ends. And this pairing is quite, quite special. So the out shuffles and the in shuffles map around these pairs. And typically in the shuffle group, we get um, a, a, a symmetric group on n pairs that's permuting around the pairs. And we get several copies of a group of order two, which is swapping the, um, swapping the individual pairs. And so the biggest thing that the shuffle group can be is to have n lots of twos, which swap the n pairs, one for each pair, and an n factorial number of permutations of the n pairs. That's the largest it could possibly be. And it's really quite a large number. It's bigger than exponential. And most of the shuffle groups have this size. Sometimes they lose one of these twos and sometimes they lose a two from the symmetric group. But most of the time they're as big as they can possibly be. There was that First row, if I take you, whoops, back, whoops, yes. This top row here, now that's a bit different. It's much smaller. It's got the end pairs, but instead of having a big symmetric group on top, it's just got some tiny little cyclic group. It's, it's, it's logarithmic in N instead of being more than exponential in n. It is much smaller than the general statement. And then the two small cases at the bottom, well, they're just a little bit smaller than the, um, than the, 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 the normal stage. Um, the, the n equals six one has a projective group here, which is one sixth as large as the symmetric group on six things. And the 12 here has an, a very surprising Mattia group M12. And so if we go on to this um, picture of all the simple groups, we see that this kind of simple groups that are occurring in the shuffle groups, well, inside of the symmetric groups, we're getting all of this yellow column. They all occur as, comp as simple composition factors. We just get one of these guys. Well, really, that's a fake. I wish they'd started out with that 
a one of five. Um, we get one of those, we get one of the sporadics, and we get one of the cyclic groups, the C2 occurs all the time. So we're getting quite a variety of the simple groups involved in our shuffle group, but certainly not all of them. Okay, so that was the perfect shuffles with um, two N cards. Now, Diaconus, he actually started life as a magician, not a mathematician. He was a magician first and a card player. And so he's very interested in these card shufflings. And he suggested to a colleague of his, um, Kent Morrison, that we should uh, perhaps consider um, a many-handed shuffler. Imagine I'm an octopus with many hands and I've got a deck with um, K times N cards and I'm going to cut the deck into K piles each with size N. And I make my K piles of N each, and then I want to shuffle them, perfectly interleave them. What should that mean? Well, perhaps um, I have the first card, the second, the third, and the last one. Perhaps the out shuffle could mean I pick up the top card from each pile in turn, and then I repeat, repeat, repeat until I've shuffled all the cards. And that's my out shuffle. So if I have um, 12 cards and I divide them into three piles with four each, then um, this out shuffle would pick up card zero and then four and then eight, then one and five and nine. So I would get um, this new listing, this new ordering of the cards. And then if I want to work out what permutation have I actually done? Well, zero is where it was. 11 is where it was. One goes to position three. Three goes to position nine. I, I get this one running around in a cycle of length five. And then I get another two, six, seven, eight, ten, also a cycle of length five. Something different is happening. So that is my out shuffle. Hmm, but what about an in shuffle? What should I take for the in shuffle if I've got three piles? Um, hmm. Well, let's just think what think back to the perfect shuffles. There was the out shuffle and the in shuffle. And the only difference was that when I split them into two, I could have got the in shuffle by swapping the piles and then doing an out shuffle. That's what a mathematician does, right? You reduce the problem to something you know how to do already. And you hope that you've done something simple or helpful. So uh, what that really is, let, let's start again. I have my pile of cards. I divide it into two. And it's a bit like I put the left-hand pile on top of the right-hand pile. That's not what I did, but supposing I did that. And then I did an out shuffle. That would be the same as the in shuffle. So I have this... Um, swapping of piles, which corresponds to some kind of permutation. And for the perfect shuffle, in, with two piles of cards, there was only one thing to do, was, was to swap the two piles. But what should you do when you have many, many piles of cards? Um, perhaps you allow every swapping of the piles of cards or perhaps you only allow to reverse the ordering, or perhaps you allow something different. So um, what we decided to do was, uh, we being Carmen and, um, and Luke and I, we decided to allow an arbitrary um, set of possibilities of swapping the piles of cards. 
And since we're allowed to do this over and over again, what we're really doing is allowing a subgroup of interchanging of the piles of cards. And if we fix what that is, and we don't know what it should be, but we're going to just allow all of them and see what happens, we get a generalized shuffle group. And it um, is generated by this swapping of the piles of cards and the followed by the out shuffle. So it depends on P, maybe. P tells us what K is, and it depends on the, the size of the piles of cards N. And so we're getting a some sort of permutation group on KN cards. Again, we are not the first person to study this. Um, as I said, Diacon has suggested to Kent Morrison that he should look at it. And there's another beautiful paper um, a little while later, 87, that's a long time ago now, isn't it? 1987 in the Math Magazine, um, a paper by Steve Medvedjov and Kent Morrison. I'm going to call that the MM work, M for Medvedov and M for Morrison. And the other um, contribution here that where I heard about it is from, by John Cannon. Uh, John Cannon is from Sydney. He's all, the author of the computer system Magma. And he produced some early computational um, information with Kent Morrison. And John Cannon gave me a piece of paper once, one sheet of paper, and I have taken its picture and put it up here. I didn't know what it meant. It's got um, Ks and Ns. It's got different numbers of cards. It's got some funny squiggles about different groups. I had no idea what it was, but I kept that piece of paper. He gave it to me about 30 years ago, <laughs> um, 1984. And um, it took a long time before I had enough um, energy and uh, um, interest and found someone to work on it with me to try and work out what this bit of paper might have meant. Anyway, let me tell you about MM. What did they do? They focused on the case where you were allowed any permutation of the piles of cards at all. So the symmetric group of degree K. They um, did quite a few things. They found out that um, there was a special case, just like uh, Diaconis had uh, in the perfect shuffles with two piles of cards, um, if the number of cards was a power of two, that was special. So they found that if you had K piles of cards, and your number of cards was a power of K, then that gave you an exceptionally small shuffle group. Turns out, well, you don't know what that means, but let's just say this is exceptionally small. Um, another thing they did, well, with these um, swapping of piles of cards uh, and then converting them into permutations of the cards, sometimes those permutations are odd and sometimes they're even. Occasionally they are all even, and so the shuffle group consists entirely of even permutations contained in what we call the alternating group. It's not so difficult to work out when that happens. It just depends on certain congruences of N and K mod four. So that's one of the things they did. Another thing was that they did some computations for small values of K K being a three and a four because K equals two. We knew exactly what happened by the earlier paper. So K is three and K is four. And they were able to compute what was going on for some small values of N, not very many, but they convinced themselves that this power case was really exceptional. So the, the number of cards being a power of K and another one where it's almost a power of K. If K is four, and perhaps the size of the pile is perhaps an odd power of two, so almost a power of K. That also was exceptional, but they believed from their computational evidence that in every other case, if you allowed any, any swapping of piles at all, so shuffle group of sim K, you should get a giant you should get the full symmetrical alternating group, really quite different from the K equals two case. That's what they believed. 
that's all that's in their paper. Okay, so let me tell you what we did. <laughs> I'll tell you all now, so I'm not, I'm not um, keeping any secrets back, and then I'll try and talk a little bit about how we did it, or what really we did. So first off, we decided to explore shuffle groups where you could specify arbitrarily what you were going to allow for the swapping of the piles of cards, what, what sorts of swaps you would allow. Um, we showed that even for general P, that the power case was indeed special. That's one thing that we did. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, we started to ask properties like, supposing inside of my allowable permutations of the piles of cards, I could take any pile and place it in any other position. That is, supposing that this P is transitive, I can go from any pile to any other pile. Um, is it true that I could take any card I like and move it to any other position? So is it true that the shuffle group would actually be transitive on, or on the cards, on the set of KN cards? And um, we're going to answer yes to that. But so, so that was one of the properties that we could think of. Are there certain properties of what you are allowed to do with the piles of cards, which lead to similar properties for the whole shuffle group? So we asked those questions. And then we kept focusing on this MM conjecture that usually you should get a giant. We can't prove it. It's still open. But what we could do was find three infinite subfamilies of k's and n's where we could prove it. So if k is bigger than n, we could prove it's true. If k is a power of two, at least four, and n is anything at all, we could prove it. And if k and n are both powers of some smaller number, again, we could prove it. We cannot prove it in any other case. So it's, it's totally open, open um, conjecture still. But um, in doing so, we, I think we gained quite a bit of insight and we opened up some new questions. So I'm going to spend the rest of the time telling you a little bit about what we did and how we did it and what questions we were asking. So we're going to take um, P. It's a, a set of permutations of the piles of cards. And the first thing we asked was if that is transitive, if I can get from any pile to any other pile with something in P, is my shuffle group transitive? And the answer is yes. So let me just indicate, how would you prove this? How would you prove this? So firstly, I'll do it with this little example here. So I've got 12 cards and I've split them into three piles of four. So this first pile is zero, one, two, zero, one, two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, and eight, nine, 10, 11. Okay, so supposing that I wanted to swap um, pile zero and pile one. So I'm gonna swap pile zero and pile one. And then I'm going to reassemble my cards. What have I done to the set of cards? Well, I've swapped card zero and four, card one and five, card two and six, card three and seven, and I've left these other ones alone. Okay? So what I'm saying here is that every permutation of the piles of cards corresponds to a, a, a permutation of the whole set of cards. And what I haven't written in here is the, is the cards which were fixed, okay? So this is really what I'm doing to 12 cards. Okay, so um, what are we doing if we're trying to, um, to, to prove this? Well, we've got our cards, there are KN cards for some reason, and we debated this for a whole year, we start calling the cards 0, 1, up to Kn minus 1. 
And the set of, of piles we're calling pile zero, pile one up to pile k minus one. And so here's our pile zero, it's got cards zero up to n minus one. Now, if I, first of all, were just to, oh, let me go back, that's too complicated. If I were to allow myself um, the, uh, the permutations just of the piles of cards, how much could I mix up the cards? Well, I think you probably agree that I would be mixing up this top layer and then the second top layer, the third and the fourth layer I could get anywhere I like within those layers. And the only thing I've got left to do on top of that is the shuffle. And so somehow we've got to prove that the shuffle would take some card in say the top layer and take it to some other layer. And if I did the shuffle enough times, I should be able to mix up and get anywhere between those layers so that I would be able to move any card anywhere. That is, I would be transitive on the cards. Um, and it's not too hard to see that that is true for the little example I've given you, but there's a rather beautiful bit of mathematics that's happening with the shuffle. If we have a look at this shuffle up here, zero is fixed, that's fine. One goes to position three, that's three times one. Two goes to position six, and that's three times two. And three goes to position nine, that's three times three. And four goes to, oops, position one, which is actually three times four, if I took away 11. And if we keep going, 5 goes to 3 times 5 minus 11, 6 goes to 3 times 6 minus 11, 7 goes to, well, we'd like to do 3 times 7, which is 21. We can't just, well, that's all right. 3 sevens are 21 minus 11 is 10. 8 goes to 3 eighths are 24. I have to wait, take away 2 times 11. So in fact, what is happening is that there's some bit of mathematics happening in this shuffle, which is kind of pretty. So in general, the shuffle fixes the zero card and otherwise it takes card A to, now what was the three? That was the number of piles. So I multiply by K, the number of piles. And if I end up with something that's too big, I subtract away one less than the number of cards, K and minus one. The only thing is that I want the remainder to be between one and kn minus one. Okay, and that works. So there's this really rather pretty formula for the shuffle and that helps us to, to do some mathematics using this interesting thing with the shuffle. Um, I have given this talk before and someone asked me, okay, so that's a transitive group which gives you a transitive shuffle group. How about if you started off with a, a set of um, permutations of the piles which was not transitive? Do, is your shuffle group not transitive? And actually, I have to tell you, I don't know. I, um, I actually did the um, computation with all of the not transitive subgroups of SIM3. And sure enough, I got an intransitive and not transitive shuffle group for all of them for um, n equals 4 but I have no idea what happens in general. Someone should have a look at that, I think. That would be a nice, nice problem. So that's the first thing we did. So what else would we be interested in with our permuting the piles of cards? Um, here's a picture, the universe of all the permutation groups. And in the middle, there's the symmetric group and there's the alternating group. And here's all the transitive groups. And if we start off with um, P being transitive, then our shuffle group is transitive. Inside of that, there's another set of groups that group theorists are quite interested in. They're called the primitive groups. And primitive means, well, I could say it quickly, but I might not explain it very well. The only invariant partitions are the trivial ones. 
So there's a definition of being primitive. There are good tools for studying primitive groups and also the symmetric group and the alternating group are primitive and we were interested in the NM conjecture. So we thought, okay, if P is primitive, is the shuffle group primitive? So let me really explain what primitive does mean. Here's an example of a group that's not primitive. I've got um, N equals four. I've got zero, one, two, and three. And if I um, look at this dihedral group, the group of rotations and reflections of the square, um, I will get a group that preserves the partition of being opposite, 0, 2, and 1, 3. And because there's this partition that's preserved by the um, this dihedral group here, we're going to call this one imprimitive, not primitive. And so to be primitive, there should be no partition which is preserved in the sense that all of the permutations just map those parts around amongst themselves. In the case of perfect shuffles with two piles, Diconis and Cantor and Graham showed and discovered that their shuffle group was not primitive because it preserved the, the pairings of the cards. So none of those shuffle groups are primitive. But once we've got three or more piles of cards, maybe, maybe the groups can be primitive. So you might ask, if P is primitive, can, should the shuffle group be primitive? Well, we already know that the answer is no, because if K is two, then the symmetric group on two things is primitive, uh, but the shuffle group was not primitive. So there's got to be something added. And what happens is that some groups are regular and some groups are not. So what does regular mean? So a, a, a regular permutation group is one where for every pair of points, there is exactly one permutation that takes the first point to the second point. And, the, and there's this interesting thing that, that if a primitive group is regular, then that's only possible if the number of points that's permuting K is a prime and that group is cyclic of prime order. And remember, that's exactly what was happening for the case when K was two. You put in a primitive regular group and you get up something which is not primitive. But we proved if you put in a primitive group of pile permutations, that is primitive but not regular, then the group that you spit out, the shuffle group, is primitive. That's good. What next? Well, maybe we should think a bit carefully. Um, what if P is odd and you just put in the cyclic group of order P? Well, we were able to look at this case and we could prove that yes, it was imprimitive if the number of cards is actually a power of that prime. We could prove that. So that had to be left out. But actually, we started doing some computation. We said, if, if n is not a power of p, let's work out the shuffle groups. If we put in just the tiniest amount, just cycling around the piles. We, we worked out for p being up to 13, the prime up to 13. And for the size of the piles from n up to 1,000. And we found that provided that n wasn't a power of p, we were getting our, a giant. And that's really outside of the MM conjecture. And we, we actually believe, I mean, that's such a lot of data. We do believe that this is true always. So this is one um, conjecture or question that we are asking. So something more than this is happening but we can't prove it. Okay, so where else did we go? I said that we discovered that the power case was special, especially small for any, any um, input P. Um, we, we 
were able to prove that no, no matter what transitive group P you put in, that the shuffle group, if N is a power of the number of piles, is, is um, a wreath product uh, that you might learn about um, with, with just a cyclic group sitting on top and a bunch of um, copies of P on the bottom. You should think of that as being small. And that really does generalize both the DGK and the MM results. Then we started asking questions. What other, what other structure could you have with a group, that, with a primitive group? Well, one thing is you might have um, a structure of a vector space. Of course, you could only do that if the number of piles was a, a power of some prime. But supposing this was the set of vectors of vector space, then maybe you would ask that all of your, um, your permutations in P should be preserving that structure. That means maybe they're like a, a non-singular linear transformation followed by a translation, a sort of affine map. And so we'll say that in that case, that, that the P will preserve an affine structure on the set of piles. So the, set, the number of piles has got to be P to the K, it's P to the something or other, K is P to the E, say. And then we might ask, does the shuffle group preserve an affine structure on the set of cards? Well, that probably doesn't make much sense because it couldn't unless k times n was also a power of p. But what we proved was that if that's true, so if n is also a power of p, then the shuffle group does preserve a, an affine structure. So affine for p implies affine for the shuffle group. Um, that was a bit of a surprise, really didn't believe it to start with, but we were able to prove it. And we proved a little bit more, and I will come back to this, but I'll just say it now. If n is not a power of p, and if we have a, a few more extra conditions, so not in general we can't do this, then we could prove that the shuffle group was a giant. And now this proof... Um, well, it depends on some extra conditions. So K had to be bigger than N. And P, I'll tell you what this is in a minute, had to be too transitive, affine. But our proof here was very deep. It relies on the finite simple group classification. Quite a deep proof, but said that in certain circumstances, we can input a too transitive affine group and output a giant, and we can prove it. Okay. That's one thing. What else? Well, maybe, maybe some other structure. The other sort of structure that you tend to find is called a product structure. Your number of cards might be a power of L, L to the E. And that means that you're, you're thinking of these elements from one up to zero up to K minus one, you're really thinking of them as being E tuples from a small set of size L. And what sort of permutations would preserve that kind of structure? Well, the permutations would be allowed to permute these entries independently. And then you might have some other permutations which would permute the entries. And we'd think of that as pres preserving the product structure. So if the input group preserves a product structure, then we want to know, does the shuffle group preserve a product structure? And again, we would answer yes, whenever it can. That is, whenever the size of the pile is also a power of this number L. So we could preserve a product structure for P, and then we would prove that the shuffle group preserved the product structure. Well, okay, that's enough of this <laughs> general nonsense. Um, if we want to con con confine ourselves, restrict ourselves a little bit more, um, to, we go from transitive to primitive to too transitive. What does too transitive really mean? So this is a smaller group of permutation, smaller set of permutation groups, still contains a symmetric and alternating group. Too transitive means that, yes, it's transitive, but when you look at the subgroup that fixes one of the points, fixes zero, then it's still transitive on the rest of the points. So that's two transitive. Two transitive groups are a special kind of primitive group. 
what happens if you put in a two transitive group? That would be quite nice. It's transitive on all of the pairs of things, pairs of um, uh, pairs of piles. Um, you want to know, is the shuffle group transitive on, on the pairs of cards? Can you move pairs of cards independently to, all, all over the place? Um, well, we couldn't show it all the time, but we could show that if K was bigger than N, bigger than 2, yes, the group is too transitive. And here is when we, so there, up to this point, we hadn't really used anything except the elementary combinatorics and permutation group actions. Very nice. But at this point, we said to ourselves, because of the finite simple group classification, we know all of the finite two transitive groups explicitly. Surely we should be able to get a, a stronger result than this. Can we be more specific? Now, the thing about two transitive groups is that in a sense, there's only two sorts. There's the affine sort, and we always, they're the ones which are acting on vector spaces. We already talked about those. It's the affine sort and there's the almost simple case. So what we were able to do was if we inputted an affine group, we knew that we were outputting an affine group if we could. So if we couldn't, we uh, worked out in this case, these are the extra conditions that I showed you before. Not only was the output group to transitive, but um, in fact, it was a giant. So that was really an amazing thing. We, to us, we were very surprised that we could prove that. In the almost simple case, if you input a two transitive almost simple group, we prove that you outputted an almost simple two transitive group. The um, big thing that we really worked hard on was that if we inputted the alternating or symmetric group, which is getting towards the MM conjecture, then we proved that the output was the giant, the alternating or symmetric group. So we, we in a very horrible method, we were able to prove the MM conjecture in this case with K being bigger than N, bigger than two. How am I going? I can leave this last bit off if we're too close to the end. There was one last thing that we were going to do, which gave us this extra um, third case where we were able to prove the MM conjecture. But I think perhaps it's getting a little bit late. Shall I skip this? Maybe. Yes, I think. It's, I'm looking at my time here and it looks like it's a little bit late. Um, I would let's just like to tell you, if anyone's look, asked me terribly hard, I can talk to them later, but this is what we've done. We were focusing on this MM conjecture, which says apart from the product, the power cases, the shuffle group, if you input all possible um, permutations of the piles, it should be a giant. And I've told you a little bit about how we proved it with K bigger than N. Um, for the K, K equals two to the E, um, that was involved in the side I didn't quite tell you about. Um, if K and N are both um, powers of L, we've uh, been able to prove that by our product case um, uh, uh, slide that I was, was, was telling you about. Um, it, it, all of our work led us to, um, to ask a few more questions. So that if K is an odd prime of less than N and, and we're not in the power case and we only allow ourselves to cycle around the piles of cards, we really believe that we should get a giant in that case. But we don't know how to prove it. We've gone through um, actually many, many um, uh, computational exercises and everything seems to be suggesting that that's true. Um, but uh, we're only touching the surface, I guess. There are many questions. If anyone is interested in any of this stuff, there are so many questions that you could ask about it. Um, Percy Diaconis, our magician mathematician, is particularly interested in the case where all you are allowed to do to the pile of cards is simply reverse them. It's really like 
a fairly nice analog of the in shuffle where you just reverse the reverse the two card piles of cards. There's not much of this available in the MM paper. There's nothing available, nothing much about it in our paper. Um, Luke and I have started to think about this and perhaps there's something really interesting happening there. Perhaps we'll at last be able to make some sense of that um, blue sheet of paper that I showed you from John Cannon, which shows some data which has got some rather interesting groups on it. But I think really it's time that I should stop. And um, thank you very much for listening. Um, thanks for your attention. Um, I hope it was fun, a little, a little bit of fun, and I'd be really happy to um, answer any questions that you might have. So any question, remark? Oh, I should be able to. So we give some time to the people to type down. Okay. <laughs> questions. At the moment, no questions. Do you know what the um the flower is. What kind? This is <laughs> this is a, a kangaroo paw. It's the uh, the flower for Western Australia, my state. <laughs> How big is it? <laughs> um, well, they they grow tall from the ground, about that tall, and the flower might be about this big. That one's just coming out. They each of these, <laughs> each of these um, little bits will open out, and inside it will become yellow. Um, it's very, very beautiful. <laughs> and is it and they, or sorry, the, is it uh, very common? I mean, in um, yeah, in in some parts of Western Australia, so. Um, there's a bushland park quite close to where I live and in August and September you can walk through and you'll see this growing under the trees uh, with many, many other wildflowers, but, but this is one of the first ones that comes out in the springtime. Okay, at the moment just one. Uh, Claudia Malvenuto is thanking you. Um, uh, Cheryl, for your interesting and very clear talk. So, thank you, Claudia. The first feedback we have. <laughs> it seems that we don't have questions. Usually, when we are in real, then we. <laughs> we <laughs> <find> yes. <laughs> I don't know how we can do that. Um, uh, electronically, I mean. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Andrea, you don't have microphone. Your, your mic is off. Micro is off. Okay. Please. Yes, in the meantime, I have a question. And uh, near to the end, uh, I... Yes. You present a, a statement saying that if P is almost simple, uh, then the shuffle group is almost equal. Yes. Uh, it's strange for me, this statement, because, uh, uh, of course, uh, I believe because uh, you, are pro you want to prove that the shuffle group uh, contains the alternating group. But I'm not able to imagine what does it mean to prove that it is uh, almost simple. Oh. <laughs> Um, that's probably not, not too, too hard to prove this bit. Once we had proved that if you put in a, oh, I mean a two transitive, almost simple case. Yeah. 
Oh, I see. Too, too transitive, almost simple. Yes, yes. But mm. do you find the relation between uh, T and the shuffle group, or it may be any too transitive, uh, almost simple group? Well, we think that it's probably the that the shuffle group is is uh, the the giant, but okay. we haven't been able to prove it. Um, it's like k bigger than n bigger than two, p being too transitive. Then we proved that the shuffle group is too transitive, but that's quite quite nice. You know, you're just using some combinatorics. That's okay. And then if we put in an almost simple group. Um, we know we're outputting a two transitive group. If it was not almost simple, it would have to be affine. I see. So the um, number of points would be a power of a prime, which would mean if we go back that K would be a power of a prime. And so then we're asking, well, what would be the almost simple two transitive groups which are a power of the prime. And that's a hard one to answer. They're mostly maybe P, S, L, N, Q, and it's an, an unsolved number theoretic problem about when the number yeah. of points there is a power of a prime, but they're the ones we would have to look at essentially, yeah. So it, it gets a bit not, not pleasant doing those. <laughs> Those, that's part of the, the analysis. <laughs> uh, Cheryl, uh, Professor Arrigo Bonisoli is typing that ah. he says, maybe my computer science students will be happy to know that they are actually playing cards when they are computing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> Thank you, Arrigo. <laughs> Actually, if some of your computer science students would like to um, to tell me what's going on with the intransitive case, that might be a nice thing to do. They could work it out for some small cases, whether if you input a, an intransitive group, do you actually output an intransitive group? I really don't know. I mean, maybe that's not true. It's just that one small case, it was true. <laughs> Okay, there is another question. Uh, Cheryl, can you read the chat or do you prefer that I read it? Yes, uh, from Maria Pia. Hi, Maria Pia. <laughs> if P <laughs> is of affine type, yes, and the, and the shuffle group cannot be affine type, then it is giant. Um, the answer is yes, we know that's true if K is bigger than N is bigger than two and P is too transitive affine type. Um, uh, what happens if P preserves a product structure and the shuffle cannot preserve a product structure? Oh, do I know an answer there? Um, let me see. <laughs> I think that I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anyone does. Is that true? Hmm. I don't think I know the answer, Maria Pia. Um, I, might, I might be lying in the sense that I should know the answer, but I, I actually think it's not known. Um, Everything we know, Maria Pia, is, is in the paper. Um, it's on the archive. Uh, we, we put it up hmm, a few months ago. It's Carmen Amara and um, Luke Morgan and me called something like the Mathematics of Shuffles or something. Um, there's just so many questions we can't answer. <laughs> It would be lovely if someone would like to look at some of them. <laughs> I think the con our conjecture would be that it's a giant. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Piero Giacomelli is saying, nice presentation, really appreciate it. <laughs> we all appreciate thank you, it. Thank you, Thank you very much, really. Thank you. <laughs> and so, clear. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we assume that we don't have uh, further questions. So, thanks to everybody, thanks to the participants, uh, and uh, thanks to Sherry. It was a wonderful experience uh, for me to follow uh, your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. <laughs> See you soon in Padova. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>